We are continuing our discussion of Islam, um, and we talked in our last session about how there is such a desire to, to uh, submit every aspect of life to the authority of the Quran, and Muhammad is viewed as the perfect example of what that means to obey the Quran. And so the whole system began to develop in a way that could help to, uh, to instruct people on how to conduct yourself if you really are living in harmony with the Quran and with the model that Muhammad exemplified. And so that became the Sharia system. Now notice again, it took 400 years for this to happen. 200 years for the Hadith to be completed and then another 200 years until the Sharia systems were completed. And there are several Sharia systems, not just one of them. There are voluminous volumes of, uh, of written material instructing a Muslim on every aspect of life, how he should conduct himself. This whole process of exploration, of investigation, of writing, uh, is called ijtihad. Ijtihad is insight and wisdom brought to the process by um, wise men through consensus. It's quite a process. Once this process was completed, <coughs> and this would be 400 years after Muhammad's death, once this process was completed, why the Sunni Muslims decided that the door for ijtihad is now closed, which means the legal systems are now in place and they should not be tampered with anymore. In fact, if you try to rewrite the Sharia, this is called bidah, which means innovation and change and that is strictly prohibited in the Quran. And so this is the challenge of modern day Islam, attempting to apply laws and systems were, that were put in place a thousand years ago to the modern world in which we live. It's not an easy task. And um, throughout the whole world, wherever there are Muslim communities, this struggle goes on uh, of how to live faithfully to this conviction that the door for ijtihad is closed in a modern changing world. It's an enormous task. And sometimes Muslims do quite well at finding the way through the challenge. At other times, of course, as we know, things unravel and uh, even can deteriorate into, um, into violent confrontation sometimes as Muslims seek to find the way uh, to apply the teachings and model of Muhammad whose sunnah shows the way to obey the Quran fully and whose Sharia system helps to define how one functions in every detail of life. It's quite a challenge. And so Global Islam uh, has, uh, has a mission to share this, uh, this, this news. Uh, the, the, the Quran says that the, that the, uh, that the uh, Ummah, is to be a witness over the nations, to be an, uh, an imam over the nations, uh, showing the way. So it has that mission. Sometimes that mission becomes politically active um, and other times uh, not so. So you have uh, faces of Islam which are quite polit politicized and other faces of Islam which are um, very content not to get involved in the political agenda. And so it's a very challenging time for Muslims all over the world as they seek to find a way to be faithful to their mission in the world in which we live. Now, early on in the Muslim community, uh, there was a great division that took place. And this had to do with the leadership of the, um, of the, uh, of the movement. After Muhammad died, why um, there was a faction uh, who believed these were called the Sunni Muslims. They believed that the leadership of the community should be carried forward by uh, a person who was selected by the wise ulama. The ulama are the wise men who understand the Quran very well. And that they would be the ones who would decide who the political leader should be of the movement, of the, uh, of the Islamic uh, ummah. Another faction said 
that the leadership of the community should be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. And these, that faction was referred to as the Shia. And it became a very, a very uh, difficult issue. So difficult, in fact, that there was a civil war about it uh, quite early on. And um, so that division <laughs> within the soul of Islam between the Shia movement that says that the leadership of the community should be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad and those who said the leadership of the community should really be chosen by the wise people of the community. That division is with us even today in the form of the Shia wing of Islam who believe that the leader should be a descendant of the Prophet. They call that leader the Imam. He is the leader of that community. He is a descendant of the Prophet. And the other wing says, no, the leader should be chosen by consensus of the people. 10% uh, of the Muslims in the world are Shia. 90% are Sunni. Um, and um, the Shia groups, I said groups because there's a number of Shia groups, not just one, having to do with disputes about who would be the legitimate heir. If suppose one was not a righteous man, the other was a righteous man, and both are descendants of the prophet, which one shall be chosen? That sort of thing. Sometimes divisions came within the Shia movement. Within the Iranian movement, there's a particular challenge because they say that the 12th Imam vanished. And that was some 800 years ago that he vanished. And so for all these centuries, the Shia Muslims have not had an Imam because the Imam vanished. But within the Iranian revolution, they believe that if they can truly, truly establish a political religious system, which, uh, which the... Uh, uh, which the imam who has vanished, which observes <laughs> wherever he is, and he is pleased with it, then he will return again. And so their beloved imam who has gone away will come back again. But he'll come back as more than an imam. He will come back as a Mahdi. As a Mahdi, which is a savior figure. And he will be accompanied by Jesus, they believe. And so this Mahdi and Jesus will work together to bring about the, uh, the, the reign of Islam throughout Iran, a pure kind of Islam, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. And so that, uh, that is a vision and a goal of this wing within Islam known as the, as the Iranian Shia, the Twelvers, or the, uh, the uh, Ithnashadi, sometimes referred to as the, as the Ithnashadi. I've been very privileged and very grateful for having had the opportunity to be involved in some theological dialogue with some of the Iranian Shia Muslims. And um, that's been going on for 12 years. Every two years we get together um, and uh, discuss issues which they elect to discuss with Christian theologians, we who are invited to, to join in that, in that gathering. Um, the sorts of issues they want to talk about would be peacemaking. That's a significant one. Ethics will be the, the, the forthcoming discussion which will take place uh, shortly. Um, the uh, spirituality, um, uh, faith and culture, um, faith and modern culture, modern society, those sorts of themes that we have dialogues about. Uh, one of the dialogues keeps coming back to the cross. Uh, within Islam, within Islam, they say Jesus was not crucified. Why was he not crucified? He was not crucified because he is the Messiah. And they believe God would never permit the Messiah to be crucified. It's the same objection that some Jews have to saying that Jesus is the Messiah. They say if he is the Messiah, how could he be crucified? Because in the Bible, the Messiah lives forever. It's a Jewish question that they often bring to Christians. Muslims bring that same question. Um, and in these, in these dialogues we have with the Shia, they, 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 uh, they raise that occasionally. At one of our dialogues, I uh, had a paper on peace in which I centered it in the cross, which I talked about the other day in this gathering here. And uh, I shared basically what I shared here about Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem to face the cross, what that means to bring about the peace. And our Shia 
uh, dialogue companion said, but that can't be. Why don't you just simply drop the idea of the cross, David, and then we could work together at finding a peaceful way forward uh, in harmony with one another, and we could just say the cross is an uh, irrelevant uh, point of difference. Now, I said you can't do that. If you drop the cross, you've really dropped the very soul of the Christian faith. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. I said, let me illustrate. And so this is the story I told them in that gathering. I said, uh, just recently, a couple months earlier, I was in Khartoum, Sudan, and I was in a group of mostly widows and orphans who had lost their, their families in the wars in Darfur. And I was asked to preach in a newly forming church that these Darfurian widows were forming. About 150 people were there. And this was my message. You are not alone. God in Jesus, in the Messiah, has come and walked among you. He was born in a manger just as your children were born under thorn trees. Jesus became a refugee when he was a child just as your children have needed to flee as refugees. All of Jesus' boyhood friends were killed just as your children have seen their friends killed likewise in this violent war. Jesus, when he traveled, often didn't even have a pillow on which to lay his head just as you in your wanderings as refugees often don't have a place to lay your head. Jesus has participated in your suffering so fully, so completely, that is God with you, suffering with you. And just as your husband's bodies were mutilated and were put on a trees to die, so Jesus also, his body was beaten and mutilated and put on a tree to die. But he resurrected, God raised him from the dead, and in the same way, God wants to reach down and to resurrect you from the tremendous disasters you've experienced and to empower you to forgive those that did these awful things to you so that you may be free from the bitterness that destroys the soul. In his crucifixion resurrection, Jesus enables that miracle to happen of receiving and extending forgiveness even to those who've done such atrocities to you that you not be destroyed by the roots of bitterness. So rise up, press forward in the resurrected power of Jesus. That was my sermon to these Darfurian widows. And it's what I shared with the Shiite Muslims in, uh, in, in Qum, Iran. Then I added, I think you want me to preach a different sermon when you say I should exclude the cross. The sermon you want me to preach is that because Jesus the Messiah is the Messiah, God would never permit him to suffer in such a way. And so God raised him from, and so God uh, took him bodily to heaven. He was never crucified, never touched by the cross. You widows have to suffer, but not the Messiah. He escapes it all. That's what you wanted me to preach. I said, after I preached my sermon, those widows went out into the courtyard, and for the next 20 minutes or so, they sang and danced singing praises to Jesus, their Savior. In the midst of all their sorrow and all their suffering, there was much joy touching that group that day. But I said, the sermon you wanted me to preach, if I would have said that Jesus escapes all suffering, although you must suffer, there would have been no singing outside that church that day. So I said, please don't rob the church of the cross. It's at the very heart of the gospel message that we proclaim and that touches us with so much joy and thank, thanksgiving. So these are some dialogues we have with the Shiite, with the Shiite uh, Muslims. And